welcome back. I uh, hope everyone had a decent enough lunch. Uh, it got really hot out. Um, so um, the plan now is we're, we're actually going to do two more lectures, uh, and then we're going to go into the hands-on stuff. Um, well, this one, so I wanted to kind of extend the first level ideas to start talking about second level analysis. I scheduled this for an hour. I probably don't have an hour's worth of slides. So what we'll do is you get through this, please ask questions so I can drag it out and make it look like it. Not like I'm an idiot, you know, that I only have five slides for an hour. Um, and um, then after this, uh, Zui Tong is going to present some of uh, our image reconstruction stuff um, and kind of that background math and, and so on. And then we'll all open up MATLAB and go through the actual toolbox it, it, itself. And then we'll spend the whole rest of the afternoon with that. Uh, we have a coffee break scheduled for uh, 4.15. Um, there's probably still coffee left over from this morning. Probably coffee left over from before that even. So, so uh, you know, please drink more coffee. Um, anyway, um, OK. So let's, let's jump right back in. Uh, group, oh, what? No? Uh, someone just yelled at me. OK. So, so we'll jump right back in uh, with kind of the idea of second level analysis. So, so, so what we've done, just to remind you where we were, uh, you know, we had talked about that whole last section about the statistics and how the models need to be generalized to deal with these noise structures that we see in the time series of NIRS data, right? The serial correlated uh, physiological noise and then these outliers do the motion artifacts. And, and kind of as we were talking, I kind of gave hints to some of this group level stuff that the same themes kind of will appear here in terms of structured now spatial noise outlier channels because they made bad contact for outlier subjects uh, you know, uh, for some reason. So we're going to follow the kind of that same uh, sort of thing. Before we go there, let's talk a little bit about experimental design. This slide is not in your notes because I just added it this morning, uh, but it's based on some things that came up yesterday in kind of the office hours. With um, so, 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 so I'm going to talk a lot about group level analysis that's done on a channel by channel basis. Um, I'll also show you how to do it potentially on a region of interest by region of interest basis like that. But one of the things that kind of came up yesterday in, in, in some of the, the office hour discussions was this idea of how do you start to do group level analysis with things like a kid where the head size is changing across your population or the kid's growing or hey, I have this really nice 3D camera that I bought, and I know exactly where my optodes are on the head. How do I incorporate that in some way into your group level analysis? Right? I, I, because it's, it's one thing to know that the probe on subject number five was slightly askew you know, to the right. It's another thing to actually be able to do something about it in the statistical framework. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to. Uh, I, I'm going to try to explain uh, some of that in a little bit. But in terms of considerations like when we're designing our, at front, when we're designing our experiment and designing a probe, um, kind of our group level analysis goes all the way back to that stage. Because how we design the study, how we design where we're going to put this, has to kind of start to at least think about um, those group level ideas. And, and, and so um, issues with that. Um, say if you're studying two different groups, so let's say older subjects and, and younger subjects, right? And you're looking at cognitive resources in, say, DLPFC. And we know as the subjects get older from the MRI, we expect some sort of brain atrophy. We expect the brain to kind of be moving away from the scalp, uh, specifically in those kind of regions. And so um, this is a systematic factor that's going to affect our, when we start thinking about our group level results, um, that we're really in the methods I'm going to show you, we're not able to really deal with that at the, at the moment. And so, so um, kind of when you're setting up your study, you have to think about these kind of issues if, if you're going to have these systematic biases. And you try to um, identify them up front lets you somehow modify the experiment. So for example, for that one, if you wanted to look, maybe because of atrophy, it's not 
so valid to look at older subjects versus younger subjects because the older subjects for the same level of brain activity but it being farther away from the scalp is going to be lower amplitude. So, so you already kind of know that in, in, in your head. So maybe what you can do in your experiment is design a uh, kind of a control task. So maybe you're doing something like n back. So you have a 0 back and a 1 back and a 2 back. And what the, um, the analysis of interest might be the ratio of the 0 back to the 2 back, or a, a, a single task versus a dual task type behavior. And you're looking at kind of ratios. So the fact that the older is going to be lower, they're going to be lower for all the same tasks involving that part of the brain. And you can look at relative amplitudes in, in that way. And so that's just one way that you can start to think about, uh, and of course that doesn't work for all studies, you know, but, but it's um, starting to think about how these things, how these kind of um, systematic factors could affect your, your signal uh, in terms of, of things like head size, gender, atrophy, uh, but also things like anatomy in terms of how the anatomy within, even within a single subject varies across the head and how this dictates power and signal to noise. So for example, if you were doing a study of, let's say, cognitive processing of visual stimulus, and so you've got regions in the cognitive on the forehead, you've got re regions in the occipital cortex. The occipital cortex isn't going to be a lot harder to measure because you've got, you've got hair there in, in, in many people. You've got thicker bone, and you've got the dural sinuses, these large blood vessels that are actually going to absorb so much light you, you really don't get good signal to noise through large blood vessels. And so if you do the same experiment and you're looking at, you know, how many trials, how many subjects do I need to be powered, the answer is actually very different from the back of the measurements on the back of the head and the measurements on the front of the head. Which also means that if you want to start to compare, you know, how is the activity amplitude back here compared to the activity amplitude right there, or, or let's, let's, let me put it a different way. At the same statistical threshold, being able to reject the null hypothesis up here is actually very different than being able to reject the null hypothesis back here because you have a lot more uh, type you have a lot more uh, type two error. You're going to have a lot more false negatives back here because you're not as sensitive. So you just have to kind of think about that, which is very unique, as I said before, to mirrors. We don't have that problem with fMRI. In fMRI, if you do your statistical maps, whether you look at beta, that is the amplitude of the that you actually estimated, or the T statistic, both the maps look for the most part exactly the same. The T, you know, the, the units will be different, but you're not going to have areas that showed up in beta that didn't show up in, in the T score because for the most part your noise is all uniform. In the nears, it's it's very different. Looking at beta, the actual what is the amplitude of the brain activity is very different than looking at the statistical test because as I said, the noise is also varying over space. And so it's just something you really have to keep in mind when, again, designing your, your, your experiments in, um, and, you know, in, in terms of how many subjects you need and, and so on, is trying to think about how this, this impacts your study design. Um, probe design itself uh, starts to come into play with, uh, uh, in this idea of group level analysis. Um, so, so the ideal source detector spacing. Um, so so um, one of the questions that I still don't have a great answer for is say you wanted to study children who are growing as a function of, you know, they're growing, right? So the head size is, is changing. Is it better to use source detectors on at the same distance for the entire population even though that probe is anchored on FPZ, the probe as the head grows is kind of going to pull in. So, so it's at first maybe they're measuring back here, but as the head grows, maybe they're only reaching you know E up to C, and if they've got a really big head, maybe only getting the front at that point. But you keep the source detector pair constant. Uh, keeping the source detector pair constant means you're getting the same depth into the brain, uh, right? Although that depth means more if your head's really small versus in terms of fractional. Um, the other side is to try to keep the positions that you're measuring from constant and allowing the spacing to change. The downside of that is that with the spacing changing, you now have 
a signal to noise uh, issue because as the spacing gets bigger, your signal to noise is going to get worse. So you're going to have a systematic bias in that case between the older kids, which would then have larger spacing, and the younger kids that have less spacing. And so that creates another uh, issue with, with the analysis. And as I said, I don't really have a great answer for this. My recommendation to most studies that we do is actually keep the spacing constant, um, and then we can adjust which channels are contributing to DLPFC. Uh, and I'm going to show how to do that within our, our toolbox, um, such that maybe in the kids with the really small heads, DLPFC is channel five and six, but in the bigger heads, it's now, as it's moved in, it's now maybe channel six and seven or something like that. And so how to actually try to account for that based on head size within our analysis. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show that in our toolbox and talk a little bit about that. But again, something to think about as we set up this, our studies, is you really kind of have to um, think about how you're gonna analyze the data before you even collect a single ounce of it. Um, um, and, 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 and with that too, kind of, um, I have your, you know, typically when you set up probes in terms of ideal spacing, in the forehead you can actually go a little bit farther away and still get the same signal to noise, right? So we've gone up to four, four and a half centimeters in the, in the forehead, which is getting us deeper. We compromise, we get a little bit less signal to noise, but we're able to get deeper into the head. In the occipital regions, where the bone is thicker, you have to move your source detectors a lot closer to kind of compensate for that signal to noise. So that could be one way that you can get around this kind of idea of the signal to noise being worse here than that as well. Okay, I, if I make the source detectors farther apart, now it's equal signal to noise. But then you also have to realize that you're measuring deeper into the brain and so on. So trade-offs, but there's no really good answer for it depends on what study and what question you're actually going to ask. And as I said, thinking about what your hypothesis is up front will kind of give you guidance to which one of these paths to take to, to start to explore this. Uh, probes having, uh, so, so there's basically two types of probes that you find in uh, use in the field. There's what's called the nearest neighbor probe, which is probably 95% of years data collection. Uh, all of the commercial systems, uh, for the most part, are all what are called nearest neighbor probes. And the nearest neighbor probe is each detector only sees the light from the source that's closest to it. So, so, so the, the reason for this is if you have a detector and you have a source at, say, three centimeters, and you have another one at three and a half or four even, the one that's farther out is gonna be so much lower signal than the closer one that you just don't have the dynamic range on your detector. You can't simultaneously measure both of these distances at the same time. The only solution to that is, is either to get an instrument that has higher dynamic range, uh, so like some of the frequency domain systems use PMTs, which are a lot more money, but have higher dynamic range and let you get multiple distances, or to turn, if you want to measure that far source, you turn off the close one and turn on, you know, and then up your uh, detector gain so you can measure that farther. So, so, so some of the Tekken systems, some of the NeurX systems can do that in terms of time multiplexing their lasers, but it's not kind of the standard uh, experiment. So when you do a nearest neighbor probe and you're limited just to the nearest source detector pair, what ends up happening is you end up having blind spots in your probe. Right? Because you saw from the source here to the detector here, so a banana shape that's going like that, but immediately under the actual optodes, you kind of have a blind spot. If brain activity was occurring right there, your bananas didn't cover that, that one region. Where if you go back to some of the probes I had before of like lines of sources and lines of detectors, kind of there were blind spots in between the, these different measurement pairs. Um, and so this, this is actually going to be one of the major challenges moving ahead that I'm going to talk about in terms of root level analysis is if you move your probe just a little bit, say a centimeter and a half, half the source detector spacing, you can go from the brain activity being in a really, really sensitive spot and you're really seeing a large signal change to basically seeing nothing at all, uh, even though the activity was actually the same based solely on the source registration. So we're going to talk about that in, in a bit, but it's, again, something to keep in mind with what are the limits that you're able to 
what kind of hypotheses are you able to address uh, with this? Um, and then registration, uh, we'll talk about. So, so this is a this is uh, this is work. Uh, this is published. Um, Ashley Whiteman, who was a my research coordinator, and then my, my team there, we published that earlier this year. It's it's a paper. Uh, it's, it, it's kind of intended to be a nice resource. And what we did was we had about a hundred uh, structural MRIs from kids. I think it's seven to eleven years of age, and we ran these all through. Uh, segmentation code and free surfer and segmented out all the different layers and, and so on. And then what we did was we simulated mirrors measurements. So, so we calculated our optical forward models. So where does the light go? And from that we calculated the path length and this part of the, the differential path length and the partial path length, uh, which is you know effectively how far did the light travel and of that path effectively how much of it was through the actual and so in this paper, what we did was we started to look at uh, things like, so this is, this is a map on average in the 1020 system of where are these, it's really hard to see even this close, but where are the different anatomical regions were relative to the 1020 system to kind of give guidance of where you should start to put your probes. And then we, we, took, uh, we took that data and started to look at things like um, uh, how skull thickness, or CSF, varied with age or with gender. And one of the things, so this is a map, uh, this is across the whole population, but this is the average skull thickness uh, for the females and the males, and then the average CSF thickness between the, 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 the females and males. And what you end up seeing here, you see it really clearly on the CSF, is that you actually start to have systematic biases between, between these, these, these two. So, so the, the females on the top of the head, kind of at the, the uh, top of the head, um, you know, tended to have thicker, slightly thicker skulls. Not, I mean, not anything to, I mean, like two millimeters or so on average. But because of this, because years are so sensitive to differences in depth, that's actually going to translate to a pretty big difference in partial path length and differential path length. Same thing with CSF. The, the males tended to have a little bit more CSF. Uh, in, in that spot, so the bone was thinner, but you were filling it in with CSF. Um, and so what we did from there was, again, taking this population, we went and we calculated regional variability in the differential path length at different wavelengths and then uh, across the two genders. So again, taking basically every position on the head, so I think, I think we did um, something like 600 different source detector, source opto positions on the head with every possible combination, and looked at the differential path length and the partial volume and so on, did this at five different wavelengths for each of 100 different kids, running Monte Carlo code that each took 48 hours to run, so you can do the math of you know, 100 times 5 times 600 times 48 hours. Mm -hmm. This, we have, we have a cluster, so we ran this all on my, my big cluster with you know, 200 and some CPUs, but it still took like six months uh, to do. Uh, I, I used to, in my PhD thesis, I had a slide that I used to, it was like two CPU years of computing <laughs> to get. This is like, this is almost a CPU century to get this, this, uh, these slides. But anyway, um, so, so what you end up starting to see though is that you actually have, so here's the females, here's the males. Uh, so like my differential path length uh, at the same wavelength is a little bit larger at, uh, for, the, for the males kind of on the side of the head, which means you know, it's, it's related to that skull being different thickness and, and so on, but the light is actually going a farther distance, uh, relatively speaking, compared to uh, their, their, uh, the other gender. And you start to actually even get like asymmetries that the right hemisphere, the DLPFC, or kind of this DLPFC on the right side of the head, is um, uh, the differential path length is actually systematically slightly larger than the differential path length on the other side of the head. So, so, so these are things we're starting to explore. Please, please, please don't take this paper as an indication of, oh my god, my data is garbage because uh, I didn't account for this. Uh, the, the, these do have an effect. I mean, this is a difference of you know, what is that, maybe 10% difference in the DPF between these. So it's, 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 it's noticeable, but it's not a, 
you know, at the point that you probably need to retract all your, you don't need to retract all your papers. At least I don't want to be that person. Um, but it is something to start to think about because it's actually been something that's been very neglected in the community is, is like, is there effect of, of age and, and gender and so on. And so what we did in this paper is we have a, I'm sure the journal was really, really mad at me, but we did a huge supplemental, like 40 page supplemental that we basically had every region uh, by, by wavelength and then listed all the DTFs and, and stuff like that. Uh, so we have these huge giant tables in the supplemental material of this, of this paper um, as references to this, but okay. All right, um, where was I going with that? Oh, you know, actually I wanna go back to, oh, come on. I, I wanna revisit kind of what I left off at the, the last time I said I had slides that I moved to this. Anyway, this difference between block uh, between ERP style and canonical is estimated as human and F response. And what I had said was we are just publishing this paper uh, or uh, working on this, this paper right now. And what we did was we took um, this really nice event-related short-duration finger-tapping data that I had, and I've been gloating over for 15 years now that is simultaneous MRI years. And, based, and this is kind of the data that I keep showing of this nice thing that I have response. But if you looked across all of the subjects, we actually had a lot of variability in terms of time to peak, in terms of whether or not it had an undershoot and stuff like that. So what we did was we took that, that data set of all those different human app responses, and uh, we took that, we did a, a, a principal component decomposition, and then from that, recreated a huge um, distribution of possible human app responses, okay? So that's what we're looking at here, is the black curve here is the mean of the whole distribution. So you see it's got a pretty good shape, uh, but the, um, um, this is the 95% confidence balance and the 75% confidence balance, and, and you have a lot of variability in terms of the shape of the response that we are seeing. So what we did was we took data, um, uh, real experimental baseline data, so it has physiology, it has motion artifacts, and so on, and then we added to it uh, on again a subset of the channels a known hemodynamic response that was pulled from this population. This, this distribution. So we've simulated brain activity with some sort of somewhat non-idealized team adaptive response or variability in the response uh, with the, the different simulations. And so what we did then was we took that data and then we analyzed it with one of our standard models. And, and so, so what we looked at was we looked at the deconvolution where you, you go and you fit the whole curve and then you estimate the from a predefined window. Um, we looked at two versions of that. One, uh, which we'll see when we actually get into the code, we have, we have two versions in our toolbox. Uh, one is what you would think of as the standard deconvolution. That is, I have a 30 second finger tapping task, I use a 40 some second window and I estimate the entire response. So that's, that's kind of the standard the other version is what we call an impulse response FIR model, in, in which case what we do is we say, okay, I know the task is actually 30 seconds, so what I'm doing is I'm taking an impulse response and involving it with, by 30 seconds, and I'm basically estimating an impulse response, which should end up looking like the canonical HRF, but I'm accounting for the fact that it actually was 30 seconds long. So in that case, I'm assuming linearity. I'm assuming if I tap my fingers, for two seconds versus 30 seconds. 30 seconds is 15 segments built onto each other. So it's assuming linearity, but it's building into this idea of duration within the, the task. So you have less degrees of freedom. Uh, the other thing that actually that model lets you do is deal with conditions that aren't the same length. When you're dealing with a straight deconvolution of block averaging, every condition has to be 30 seconds, which is hard to do with, say, a self-paced task. You know, it's in, 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 and so if you do something like that where your duration is variable, using the canonical model or these impulse response models allows you to build that into the Anyway, so we did these two versions of deconvolution. We then did uh, kind of the standard uh, canonical model, canonical model with derivatives, 
And we actually put in a, we built a nonlinear model as well that, that estimated this. Excuse me. And so as, as I said, what we did was we took that data, we simulated it at, for all these different simulations, uh, different signal to noises, and then we looked at this as a function of the duration of the task. So, so, so what we found was, so this is a plot. This is, so for each one of those, we ran thousands of simulations in order to generate an area under the uh, rock curve for which we generated the area under the curve, which became one point here. So each one of these graphs represents millions of simulations that went into it at different signal to noises uh, for each you know, condition. So this is, again, another sort of use of CPU power is on this slide. Um, but so this is task duration 1, 5, 15, or sorry, 1, 2, 5, 10, uh, so increasing. And what we, so, so at low signal to noise, and this, you can't see the air, the, uh, there it is. So the green is the FI, the deconvolution, the yellow is the impulse response to the, these two guys. So, so at high enough signal to noise, and, and that's actually fairly high signal to noise, the, the FIR models are, are, are pretty good. Um, but at low signal to noise, with short duration, the canonical models, these blue ones, are actually better to, to, to use uh, than the, uh, the FIR. So even if you have a shape that's not ideal, you, having a model that has less degrees of freedom actually it helps with the area of the curve for your sensitivity. Okay. As the duration starts to in, increase, and ignore this magenta line for a second, I'll explain that. But as the, as the duration starts to increase, now all these curves kind of basically, uh, you know, at signal to noise of one, for example, they're almost indistinguishable, which means that you pretty much have the same sensitivity, kind of no matter what um, uh, model you use. Okay, that it's really in the case of low signal to noise that you see a difference, or in the case of low duration, so the one second or the two second, in which case, um, have a difference between which models you use. And we talked about that, that a little bit. Um, this magenta line, because it does look kind of messed up, uh, I'll explain that one. That's actually the Oxcar model. And so in that model, what you're doing is instead of a nice smooth shape, you're assuming a, a square wave. And what ends up happening is um, your real data goes up, goes and comes back down. And if you fit it to a square wave, it ends up looking like that in terms of the residual because you cut out a square thing in the middle and it has these really sharp edges. And that's why the boxcar fails at high signal to noise because it's not able to model these kind of these transitions at all. And that gets lumped into this kind of noise term. And so it's, it's uh, you know, that's why it has this kind of messed up shape. So, so that's kind of a statement of never use boxcar because it's actually like, it, it's, it's bad under almost all conditions. Um, but that's, this paper, we're, we're still working on this to kind of summarize, this becomes a little bit more complicated to see. Uh, one of the things that we did then was we took these millions of simulations and divided it all based on the, uh, the, the difference, the R squared difference between the canonical model and the, what was simulated and what was used to recover. And so, you know, again, asking the question of how did this being really off from the idealized model, did this hurt me more? So we have these plots of, I, I don't have the great, the great figure right now, but it's plots of um, uh, mismatch versus area under the curve. And, and what happens is the, uh, the deconvolution models can handle bigger mismatches before they start failing at high signal to noise, but it kind of becomes it, it, the FIR model or the canonical models win it. Lower signals than this. Okay. So it, it's hard to explain like this. You guys all saw that figure that I was drawing. And, okay. Yeah. So what what's the realistic SNR you get? Um. Usually it's kind of in this range, one to two. Yeah. It's it's. I think five is five signals one is a five. You can. And I don't remember how we defined signal to noise this because there's different ways to define it. Signal to noise of five, you can kind of look at the data and, and see the hematic response. Like, like from the, so like finger tap. 
finger tapping might be kind of at this range down here. But kind of more of the cognitive stuff is generally kind of in this, more of this range. Yeah. The, the gamma, the predictor, is the modeling HRF oh. with two gamma. Uh, so, so the canonical HRF, the canonical HRF is uh, the, uh, the double gamma function. So it's the gamma and it gives you the undershoot. So that's the one that's used in the happening and stuff like that. The gamma function is just a single, so it doesn't have an undershoot. So, so the, and then, yeah, if you want to look at, at this. So this, we looked at a canonical model with derivatives, which is the red curve and the uh, other green curve. I don't know where those are. They're, the other green curve is buried under there somewhere. But it's, it's um, uh, because there's two greens. Oh, yeah, okay. So, so it's actually, the, those are those are both. But um, it's, we looked at the canonical model with derivatives. Uh, derivatives help, but only if you treat them as random effects, which means you put them in the model, you solve for them, but you don't use them to define your contrast. If you start to use the, the, uh, the derivatives to define the amplitude of the contrast, you get this really high false discovery rate. Um, so, so always, derivatives are good, but only if you use them to Correct shifts in the data, but then throw it to model the noise basically and throw them out otherwise. Uh, so that's that's one of the things that, that came out of this too. Um, which in fMRI, that's how they always do it, but um, there's in years there, there's a few people that have not done it that way. So so most of the uh, short span delay that is talked are like uh, so for modeling HRS or activation. Durations are often in average of one or two seconds, and then there is a IPI of like four to six, eight seconds. So this was all we did this with um, block. We, I mean, we simulated the um, the data going in in terms of the, the responses and um, or the timing of the stimuli. We simulated it with a blocked design such that we were not they were not overlapping measurements. We wanted to avoid that. We also simulated it where it's the same, um, I don't know how do you want to say it, same fraction of the data during task as baseline for all the conditions. So at a 10 second, let's say there was five tasks, at one second there was actually 50 because it was the same amount of time spent in the active state as the baseline state, whereas as in each of the, the so we modified it that way so that signal to noise was actually comparable uh, between the different the different approaches. But yeah, it, it's it's we're still kind of summarizing this data, and you can tell a little bit that I don't have a great presentation for it quite yet because we haven't fully digested a lot of it. But um, I just I wanted to throw this in because well we talked about it in the last session, but but it was definitely something that's going to kind of come up a little bit. Um, but again, kind of back to my recommendation. Is was kind of if you go uh, above ten seconds uh, for your duration, you really don't use the box car, but pretty much no matter what else you use, you're you, you kind of got the exact same area under the curve um, to a, you know to that range of signal to noise that we can expect from our, our data. Um, if you go much shorter than that, using a single uh, canonical function is better than having derivatives and stuff. As you win from the degrees of freedom being less if your signal to noise is really low. So even though it mismatches. Okay. Um, all right. Um, is this where the slides start? No. You don't even know. Okay, well. I added a bunch. There's where the slides start. Okay. Um, this we'll, we'll, I talked about a lot of this already. Um, but one of the, I, I just, I, I don't want to badmouth NIRS SPM, I think it's a, a pretty good program, but one of the assumptions, because it's derived from fMRI, is one of the things that you do in fMRI, because you have uniform spatial noise, is in fMRI you have a lot of voxels and very little time points. And so you can pull, so, so you can get a better estimate of the noise if you pull your data across space compared to time. So what they do in SPM is you actually take 
each each vo each slice, and you take whatever the 64 by 64 voxels within that slice, and use it to compute the noise estimate. And that's this method of, of REML, uh, restricted maximum likelihood, where they're estimating these noise parameters. And, and, and again, it does so by pooling the data over space to get a more accurate, accurate um, estimate of the noise. Works perfectly fine in fMRI. However, the code, the nearest SPM code, does the exact same thing for the nearest data. And the problem there is if you have, because you're pooling all of your channels to estimate noise, it means these ones in the back of the head, which are really noisy, are actually going to corrupt the ones in the front of the head because I've got one noise estimate over the entire probe. So this can be a really bad thing. And actually, it's, it's, if you read the instruction manuals for NARES SPM, they very clearly say you have to pre-process. You have to remove all of the uh, noisy channels. You have to remove anything that has a motion artifact in it, because we're going to do these methods that are very sensitive to that. Right? So, so it just, it's, and if you do that, perfectly fine to use that, that program. Uh, again, I don't want to badmouth it. It's, it's uh, however, if you do do that, how confident are you that you fully removed and then what threshold? And so you start to get these kind of subjective questions of you know, which channel should I remove and was this bad enough um, and, and so on. So that's, that's why we would like to take more of a, a, a nears centric um, approach to this and really deal with our, 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 measures, or our features of our measures. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say to on that, and let's go to the group level stuff. So, so on the group level, it's actually it's it's actually really easy. It's the same thing that was set up at the first level model. Um, where does where do your slides start? Okay. All right, we're, we're we're getting there. We're not yet on the s slides that I I'm still on the stuff that I added this morning. At 4 a.m. Um, okay. So, 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 at the second level model, we can express our group level analysis as a linear regression model, the same way we did at the first level. Where we have now our measurement factor, our, excuse me, those coefficients that came out of our first level model. So maybe that's the brain activity for, in this case, each of three subjects. And so I have three different subjects. Each subject did two different tasks, A and B, right? So I, I have, in this case, I have, uh, you know, subject one, task A, subject one, task B, and so on. I have six measurements there. And, and so I can set this up as a linear regression. So this is my measurement part. My L matrix here is going to pick out, so the first row is going to pick out all the task A's, and the second row is going to pick out all the task B's, and then I can solve for it at the group level here. So if I invert this matrix, I'll get two coefficients, the average of condition A across the three subjects, the average of condition B across the three subjects. So exact same linear regression framework, but now doing the group level analysis. And the way that you'll see this as we start going into our code uh, and toolbox is we use a method, what's called Wilkinson's notation, which uh, I can show you why we use that in MATLAB and so on, but it's also, you find it in uh, parts of SPSS and SAS, they, they kind of accept the same uh, notation. And what this is, so we're going to write all of our group level models out with this notation, so I'll show you a bunch of examples of this. But basically, what this says is my measurement is equal to, it is modeled as this negative one means do not include an intercept term. Uh, if I had an intercept term, I'd have column of all ones that's basically subtracting out the mean of all the data. So having this negative one means don't don't do that. Don't don't put in a column of ones. And then condition, what this is going to do is this is condition in this case is a categorical variable. I have two distinct categories, A, condition A and condition B. And so what's going to happen is it's going to take that categorical variable and create two columns, one for each of the two uh, variables. Okay. So we're going to see a lot more examples of actually very powerful to start to look at interactions and, and, and so on. So what we do, uh, just like we did for the first level model, is when we solve this, we're making assumptions about the distribution of noise, common theme. And, and as I've said 
multiple times these assumptions, particularly that the data is normally distributed across space, are not true for the nearest data. So we can do the exact same method that we did at the first level, this whitened, uh, this pre-whitened weighted regression. Only the whitening terms we already know because we solved that first level model. We know the covariance structure already, so we know, we know the noise structure. And so what we can do is we can take that covariance model, that channel by channel, task uh, by task covariance model from the first level, and we can do a decomposition of it. So, so it, uh, this, would, this would be a Chalowski decomposition, but find W such that basically W squared equals uh, the, the, cover, the original covariance. So W is the square root of this matrix square root of the covariance. And we invert that, and that becomes our whitening filter. Okay? So if we apply that to our, our, our data, what's going to happen is that we took the structure of noise that we already knew, and then that's going to, the residual is not going to be white according to that, that known just like we did at the first level model, though, we're also going to do this with a robust regression that we solve for it. We take each subject, as do a studentized residual, was that subject an outlier, was that channel an outlier, or move that channel or downweight that channel using this S matrix, which again varies from zero to one as, as, a, continuous, as a continuum. And we're going to use that, that weighting matrix to downweight the channels and the subjects that were noisy compared to the rest of the Right, so we're going to do the same robust regression using the first level model as the way. Now, what's unique about this, and and um, historically, most people in years, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with having done this uh, or continuing to do this. Uh, most people, after they solve their first level model, they'll take these data from the first level model, they'll export them into a text file or something like that feed it into SAS or, or, or whatever and, and use those tools, right? There's nothing really wrong with that. Except when you, when you do that, you're ignoring the noise that the betas back here are a lot noisier than the betas right you know, in the front of the head or between subjects and stuff like that. Um, so, so, so you could, uh, like SPSS does have a weighted uh, mixed effects model where you can take in error bars in beta, but that's just the error bars in each beta. It doesn't actually tell you about how the betas were related to each other in terms of the actual full covariance structure. It's only the diagonal elements of it. So, so you can't start to get these weighted versions in something like SPSS, but by bringing the mixed effects models, the second level models, into the actual year's toolbox, we are able to actually take advantage of the fact that we know this full covariance matrix and, and Structures and actually integrate that into our mixed effects models directly. Um, and so, so, um, so, so, so let's let's uh, let's let's take another couple examples of this Wilkinson's notation. Um, so this is another this is another study. Same three subjects doing pass A and B. This time, let's tack on let's say age. So the first subject was four years old, seven. Six, and so what we can do in again the Wilkinson's notation is we can write out the formula like this, which is going this model here, drop out the intercept, have a column for each of the two conditions. So we have a task A and a task B, and then we have condition uh, colon age. So age in this case is a continuous variable, and what this is going to do is this is going to create a um, an age slope term for each of the two conditions. So, so, so kind of the combination of a categorical with a continuous variable, you'll end up with an estimate of how age affected condition one, or condition A, sorry, and how age affected condition B, right? So you're modeling the data that the, the, the measurement of condition A is the intercept term plus the slope term, which depends on which age the subject is. So you can predict any subject of any age you know, uh, from that equation. Oh, it works over the range you, you uh, estimated. Well. But that's what you're, you end up estimating, is in this case, we're going to end up with four coefficients, the intercept for condition A, the intercept for condition B, and then the two age terms. Okay? 
Now, if we, um, one of the features you're going to see when we start running the mixed effects model is we have a flag in the code called center variables. And what center variables does is these continuous variables like age, it, it basically controls whether I mean center them or not. So in this case here, uh, I did not mean center them. So I have uh, four, seven, and six in my, my model directly. So it's not mean zero, which means that this intercept term is the brain activity of, the brain activity predicted of an age zero B, right? Because I, I, I found that slope and then I extract it to the intercept uh, at zero and that's, that's the estimate of the brain activity uh, at an age zero B. Um, and the slope term is then how that brain activity varies with, with age. If you center your variables, what happens is now you subtract the mean age. So we're going to attract the, the average of 17 here. So, so these guys become, this guy becomes negative, these guys become positive, it's centered around zero. The slope is exactly the same, but now what that intercept represents is that intercept is where you know, the, the centered age crosses zero, which is my uh, center of my distribution, the center of my, uh, my the average age of my, my population. So in that case, that brain activity in the intercept term is going to represent a kid at seven and a half years old, and that's the average of my population. The slope is going to be the same. So that that variable center, that center variables flag, does not affect the slope terms, but it will have an effect on the intercept terms because it's basically changing. Um, we'll show too, we can do nonlinear models, so you can put like age squared, or you know, condition colon age, you know, plus condition colon age squared, which would be a quadratic term within there, and then it really does make a difference if you center it or not, because squared terms are, are, are that, yeah, it'll affect the sign on the squared terms. Okay, just another example here. Um, the code with this kind of notation, you can't specify random effects models. So now here's that exact same equation, condition, uh, so two condition intercept terms, two uh, condition by age slope terms, and then this notation of putting it in, in brackets with uh, one vertical line uh, and then the, 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 the name of the variable, this is telling us that we're gonna treat subject as a random variable. That's, that's kind of how this notation uh, denotes random variables is with this vertical line. And so what that what happened there is again um, we're setting up a linear regression, but now we have this we have the fixed effects term and the random effects term here, um, where this is the random effects model that's pulling out condition A, condition B, and condition C, and we're going to solve this using kind of a, a, a some sort of maximum likelihood model. Ways on this uh, compared to the noise on that. Um, is that, um, yeah? It's, uh, that's a, it, well, it's, 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 um, it's modeling the average, so it's my phone uh, I don't really understand the question. It, it's 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 because it's not acting on it's acting on the entire equation, so it's not just this part or that part. It's like the whole thing. Uh, yeah. So so in both of these, we can center age, any continuous variable. Uh, you know, we have to think about whether or not we want to center. Uh, our default is actually to center everything, so that the, the, the slope term is the average uh, of our, our group. But in this case, if we don't center it, I'm using four, seven, and six, which means that this term is capturing. You know, think of it like the, you know you think of it as a scatter plot. You know, brain activity versus age, and I have four, seven, and six, and I fit it to a line. The intercept is where that line is going to cross. You know, x equals zero. So if it's four, seven, and six, the intercept is way back here at you know, age equals zero. If I shift it, so now instead of four, seven, six, it's 
whatever it is, negative two, one, and two, or so, you know, so it's now centered around, now the intercept is right where I cross, you know, right in the center of my, my population, if that makes sense. Yeah, I guess my question will be like a random factor subject why? The, 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 the random effect is modeling the fact that um, these, this set of files can, all came out of subject one and will have the same noise properties uh, compared to this set of files that comes out of subject two. So, so here, yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, sorry. So this is, we are assuming this does come from one channel. Yeah, for this slide right now, we're doing one channel. And previously? Well, I, I'm setting up the math because the answer is actually this, that we do it for all channels, right? So, so yeah, that those equations, because writing this out for all the channels at the same time would have been a really messy slide. In reality, we're actually doing this, where we take that root level, you know, that L matrix that represents the mixed effects, we're, we're doing a chronic or product with all the different source detector pairs, such that this matrix is now number of channels times number of conditions by giant matrix. But again, having the noise term from the first level, which is the full spatial covariance, that's whitening basically this part of it. Um, so, so noise uh, is on the spatial and temporal uh, Well, noise, um, yeah, noise Noise is, your, your, your vector is beta. So beta has multiple tasks and then multiple spatial. So it's the number of uh, the number of regressors times the number of uh, source detector pairs squared. Uh, square. so, so I'm trying to clarify the difference between the first level and second level and then noise, the noise of the so, so the first level model was done, so the way that we actually do the first level model is that this make up, we have 30 source detector pairs. We solve that linear uh, regression time series model from 1 to 30, iterate through, but save then, at the end of the day, we get the estimate of all 30 datas, but then we also have this matrix of residuals that was number of time by 30. So we save, we, you know, solve the first channel, enter into the, you know, enter the residual into the matrix, keep looping through, eventually I build up that whole matrix. We take that matrix and that's where we compute the sigma squared, the covariance, not really sigma squared, it's a full covariance matrix uh, from that residual. And that's, you know, then you have the equation, you know, the covariance is uh, inverse of x transpose x times sigma squared, right? So it ends up with number of regressors, and it actually becomes like a chronic or product, but it's number of regressors times number of source detectors by number of uh, regressors times number of source detectors. But it's based on a time series analysis. Yes, so yeah. there, when you are trying to estimate the beta and the first level, yeah. time series, does a spatial noise always consider there <coughs> too? Or no, so, so at the first level model, we're treating each channel as independent, but then saving the noise structure when we go to the second level so that we can account for the fact that they weren't actually spatial. independent. Yes, yeah, so, so the first level model, our stats on the first level model, you're going to get a T-score for each source detector pair. Those are not independent of each other because these two channels right here saw the same noise. So, so they're not, it's not 30 independent T-tests at, at that point. Um, those yeah. are considered the second level. Yeah, that's considered all in the second level. That's also considered in the region of interest analysis when you do that. Okay. Which is actually the equation right there. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so, so what we actually do in practice is we solve this, this full matrix solving for every source detector pair at the same time for all the conditions and so this becomes, this for large data sets can actually become a pretty big matrix that we need to invert um, with that. Um, where do I go from here? Um, oh, and then I go into what you actually have for your slides. Okay, and, and actually what um, uh, so Kong will present later on, actually the next lecture, is you can do the same idea. So here we have just an identity operator, so source detector pairs. 
But if you actually put the four model there, now you can actually start to actually, this is a combination of group level with image reconstruction at the same time, uh, where our underlying data is actually re represents estimates in the brain space that allow us to account for the fact that the probe is slightly crooked in one subject and their anatomy is slightly different. So I'm not going to give away the next talk because that's, that's on this equation here. It ends up to be the exact same formulation that we use at a group level um, uh, image reconstruction. And then um, once you have this, this model, again, you've solved for beta, so you, know, so you have your, your, your now second level betas and their covariance. Again, the same idea of, you know, you can choose a contrast if you've got a left tapping versus right tapping. You can also, because this is, has covariance across space, as it also did in the first level, uh, if your C matrix is actually, say, um, these two channels on the left versus these two channels on the right, or let's just, let's just leave it, it's these two channels on the left, right, so it's a one for these three channels and zero for everything else, that becomes a t-test on the region of interest and it's correcting for the fact that these three channels are not actually dependent, because that's this term right here. Okay, so, 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 so by propagating this all the way through, we can keep our stats correct even at the, the region of interest uh, uh, level. Okay, so just a couple more examples. Um, so the, these are actually in your slides now. So now I've actually returned to what I was initially going to talk about. Uh, but again, as I said, Wilkinson's Rogers notation. Uh, so this, this one we saw, this one, drop off the intercept, look at any image for each of the conditions, treating subject as a random variable. In this case, this one is going to be grouped by condition. So it's going to give me an image for each condition and each group. So if I have three groups and two conditions, I'm going to end up with six total images that get spit out. In this case, it's treating age as a random variable. So the random variable, uh, you can have multiple random variables. They can be either categorical or continuous. Um, this one, this one is, is a little bit complicated here. This is group, give me a image for each group, give me an image for each condition, but I'm not breaking up. Why, why, so wait Tom or Hendrick, who put this example together? This is a terrible one here, down here. This is so complicated. This would, this would give me one image for each group, irregardless of the condition. One image for each condition, irregardless of the group. And then an interaction term. So this would be like if you were doing an app test of whether or not group matter uh, in here is, is you would set up, this, this would give you kind of that ANOVA app test of is group important in this, this model. Okay, I, you're forgiven for that because it is, it is a really good app test. To, so, it's the uh, subject's always categorical because you have a discrete number of uh, subjects. Uh, what's it? it it's it, well, it, it's think of, think of it this way: you have thirty channels per subject. You know, thirty channels within your probe. You might have three files per subject or whatever, right? So all of those channels for those three files are being labeled according to that subject. So they're, you know, in terms of the grouping of the noise structures when you solve the maximum likelihood. So, so that's what this is. It's a categorical variable that's basically grouping all the channels for that subject kind of together and all the, um, uh, you know, the, the tasks for that subject. And the channels, we've already whitened it out in terms of, so it's, so it's, so it's, 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 it's uh, uh, the fact that your channels have different noise structures, it's, it's, it's okay to get like this. Okay. Um, does that sort of make sense? We're gonna see, we're gonna go through a lot of examples and I'm gonna show you where, if you Wikipedia, you know, Wilkinson's notation actually has a pretty good description of stuff and Google, or not Google, um, uh, MATLAB actually uses a lot of this, so there's a pretty good help on Wilkinson's notation with their mixed effects models uh, within there. And that's why we're using it is because we're actually kind of fundamentally calling a version of the FIT LME, FIT uh, linear mixed effects model in MATLAB, and so we adopted the exact same notation such that 
basically we can take full advantage of their, their tool set there. Instead of full, yeah. And I'm kind of confused by it because, of course, I mean, based on what you put in there, it changes the result quite a lot. So I wonder what, whether yeah. you put full or, or yeah. yes. So, the so what? Term, I mean. so yeah, for the, the interaction terms. So so um, yeah, it's 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 basically. I think it ends up solving the model the same, but it's what you do with the result afterwards. So, so in the in the model, what you're doing, let's say you have, um, uh, let me see, let me let me think of an example. So, so, so you have, okay, we have we have we have we have two conditions, A and B. So we can either estimate A and B, mm -hmm. or we could reparameterize that as uh, kind of the average of A and B and a, a delta, you know, kind of a, uh, let's say. A term and a B minus A term, which is the delta, right? And, and so that's the difference between the effects and the full model is the full model is A and B like as separate entities and the other one is like one of them is a perturbation of this. You're actually directly estimating the difference between A and B versus A by itself and B by itself. I don't use the interaction stuff very often at all. And I mean, I haven't ranked is Frank here? No. Adam, who's sitting behind you, has done uh, some of the. the yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so. Yeah, yeah. No, that's but, but, but yes. Yeah. So, if Frank, if Frank comes in, he's actually done a little bit more of the interaction part. I've, I've stuck to kind of the standard mixed effects with no interactions. Um, but I. I'll return to that question for you. We, we, it's, it's something that I know Adam is very interested in. And that's, I, I will say with a disclaimer, my, I'm an, well, my undergrad degree is genetics, biochemistry, and chemistry. I did my PhD in biophysics. I then joined radiology and engineering, and I somehow became a statistician. You know? <laughs> so, 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 I, that's more of an epidemiologist who really knows how to do these things with SPSS type question. Um, but it's, um, uh, let's continue to talk because it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, is there any um, specific ways to analyze the data that you have in the model? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so I'll show uh, in the code where you can pull out like the app test and, and stuff like that from your model fits. Um, you can also do like once you solve the model, you can go back and do a scatter plot of that data, that example where you have age and subject. We can make a scatter plot of for a region of interest or for a single source vector pair, brain activity versus age as a scatter plot with the line going through it, which is you know, which is the line that we fit when we solve the problem. So, so for, for for what? For uh, estimating the goodness of fit. Um, Wait, Tom, do you have an answer for that one? What's the best way? I mean, I've always just got app tests out of it um, for, for goodness of fit for the model. Um, you didn't hear the question? Yeah, that's uh, uh, right now in the code, it outputs app tests. For that. So, so you know, we have distribution. Because if I'm not wrong, the different regions are right. Yeah. Yeah, it's not. It's not using. Well, that's that's how you solve the maximum likelihood in the REML is how you regularize the, the model. Uh, how does that? Okay. 
Okay, we'll have to t maybe we'll talk about this later because I don't know what you're referring to with the value for, for that. So I'm getting a little confused, and that's what you're referring to it because actually I'm, I'm now, even though I said I didn't have an hour's worth of material, I've already talked for 65 minutes. <laughs> so, so, um, yeah, so, so this is, this is, uh, uh, this is actually what's in your, your slide or your, your handouts, just kind of a little bit more examples of this kind of showing how the models actually get set up. Um, these are a little bit more complicated uh, versions, so which is why I started with the more simpler slides to kind of explain this. Um, but but you, can, you can go through and um, I'll, I will present this slide though, because this is, this is actually in our the toolbox paper that just came out. And so this is this is really looking at the effect of that idea of having outliers. So what we did was took data. So we simulated, you know, took, took, some, took some, some, some data, simulated brain activity on a subset, ran it through group level analysis to do rock curves and, and, and so on. And if, so, so each one of these lines represents a source detector uh, pair from this, this, this population. And see, there's, they're, they're all kind of about the same in terms of their noise level in this case. So this is with no source detector pairs that are statistical outliers in terms of noise. So in other words, everything has good coupling to the scale. And so in, in this case, what we did was we compared uh, using fixed effects, random effects, and then robust weighted versions. And you see kind of when you have no outliers, everyone is, 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 pretty, much, uh, is pretty much good. The, Random effects terms have a little bit better control of type 1 error compared to the fixed effects term, but it's not terrible, right? But everyone in terms of error in the curve is about the same. If you go to this case where we've taken, I forget what percent, like maybe 10% of the data and just injected a huge amount of noise to it. So these are bad channels in terms of coupling to the scalp. They're just huge noise terms compared to, to the rest. Now, if you, if you just run the standard model that you're ignoring the fact that you have outliers in the noise distribution, um, so this, which are the, the red and the black are the weighted versions. So now there's a big difference by adding those bad, couple bad channels between using a robust regression versus a regular regression. And, but again, kind of the type one error is, is still about the same. Whitening stuff. Um, so, so basically, what kind of the recommendation is using our mixed effects models is that you definitely want to do this weighted robust uh, version um, because if your data looks something like this, which is very often the case, uh, that you have a couple of subjects you just have bad channels for, um, it's going to be this method is going to be far less sensitive to that. Okay. Yeah. The, the, so, so this slide, or this image, is from the toolbox paper that just came out last oh, week. Okay. And that's one of the papers that is included in the handout, or in the, in the, the book here. But this figure is actually from that okay. paper. Yeah, it, it, it's, it was basically, Hendrik, that's right, correct? This was from the toolbox paper. Yeah, yeah okay. So, I don't remember anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah, but that's, we didn't go into that much detail in this simulation, and certainly we could probably publish a whole other paper looking at the you know different aspects of this. Um, but it was kind of just showing, you know, this idea of robust regression at the group level, and trying to kind of um, you know sort of justifying why one might want to you know why aren't you using SPSS right? It's so well established, it's so used in other communities. Why are you reinventing the wheel? And it's because of issues like this that are not well handled in those other programs. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This, the, the, this is the, this is all in this figure is in the toolbox paper. And I'm going to actually skip the last couple of slides because they're kind of complicated anyway. Because we're bit over and I don't want to cut into Zui uh, Hong's time. So um, is there any other questions? We've covered at this point first and second level analysis. We're going to finish up with 
image reconstruction, um, and then you all can like pass out while we you know do the the uh, the, the toolbox hands-on training because this is a ton of math, and I'm really sorry, but um, uh, okay, everyone's okay.